um, wind can do it too. We just need something to turn our magnet over our wire. And if I need something to turn the magnet over the wire, well, wind can do it. So if I have the uh, uh, wind coming in here, it uh, turns these blades. The blades now turn, and then we have the magnet and the wire somewhere in this assembly. Most likely, the magnet wire is, they have it like through a series of gears. It's probably down here. Maybe 13 and 14 is the magnet wire system. But you just got to get it to turn. Uh, another way is hydroelectric. Hydro means water, so uh, water, electric, turbine. Uh, we have a dam right here. Okay, a reservoir, and we have some water. The water falls. It hits um, a big a baffle. The baffle turns this, and now we have a generator that has a uh, what? Yep, that's right, a magnet and a wire. Lots of wire and lots of magnet, and it turns, and it makes electricity. You can see kind of a zoom in of that. You see as the water flows into here, it turns these things. It's kind of like a little propeller, if you will, kind of like for a, uh, if you're like a boat person. It turns the propeller, and the propeller turns the magnet and the wire here in the generator assembly. So what I did with the magnet and the wire was very simple, but um, really the same principle applies to making electricity. They just ramp it up to a huge, huge scale. Hey, let's kind of watch this process through um, a coal-powered plant. I have a video clip I want to watch. And before I do this, I did want to say one thing. Where is the closest coal-powered plant? And this is, if you live where we, uh, near where, where we do in Woodland Park, Colorado, if you just drive down the hill, as we like to say, to Colorado Springs, and so in Colorado Springs, this is the closest coal-powered plant. Uh, this is America the Beautiful Park, and that is the plant that you can see just as you drive down uh, Highway 24. It's hard to miss. You've probably seen the smoke coming out of it. And that's where we're getting most of our electricity is from that very plant right there. So let's catch this video clip. It's, it's relatively long. Let's see how electricity is generated from coal by taking a virtual tour of a coal-fired power plant similar to those operated by First Energy. This plant has three generating units that produce more than 2,000 megawatts of electricity. At full capacity, this one power plant can produce enough electricity to supply the needs of one and a half million homes and businesses. Generating electricity requires a fuel source. At this plant, the fuel source is coal, which arrives mainly by a barge, but also by rail and truck. Each barge delivers 1,500 tons of coal, enough to keep the plant running for a couple of hours. The plant uses about 21,000 tons of coal each day, so over a million tons of coal is stockpiled next to the plant. A device called a stacker reclaimer scoops coal onto a quarter mile long conveyor that can transport up to 900 tons of coal into the plant each hour. Once inside the plant, up to a 30 hour supply of coal can be stored in bunkers. Coal moves from the bunkers to feeders to be measured and moved to pulverizers. Each generating unit has 16 coal feeders that supply eight pulverizers. Coal enters the pulverizer and spins in a large drum where hundreds of steel balls grind it into a fine powder. Now a fine powder, the coal leaves the pulverizers and heads to the boiler. About 335 tons of coal can be pulverized per hour. Large fans add warm air to the powdery coal and blow it into the boiler. The boiler has miles of tubes filled with high quality water. Once inside the boiler, the coal ignites, releasing energy and generating intense heat that changes the water inside the tubes to hot, dry steam. The temperature of the steam is now about 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. This process generates thermal energy, which is transformed to mechanical energy at the turbine which is the next stop on our tour. High pressure steam, now 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit at 3,500 pounds per square inch, is piped from the boiler to the first in a series of turbines. Here it expands between layers of turbine blades mounted on the turbine shaft. The steam loops back to the furnace, then onto the second turbine. In this process, the steam turns the series of turbines 3,600 revolutions per minute, providing power to the generator, the last in the series of machines. 
the generator continuously creates an electrical charge of 34,481 amps at 18,000 volts of electricity. From here, the electricity leaves the plant and begins its journey to customers. After the steam has been used to create electricity, it is exhausted from the turbine and sent to a condenser to be changed back into water. Inside the condenser, steam passes over the outside of pipes filled with chilled water from the cooling towers. The steam condenses to water and returns to the boilers to repeat the steam generating process over again. As the steam condenses, the chilled water inside the condenser pipes becomes warm from the heat of the steam, so it is sent to a cooling tower. These particular towers are called natural draft cooling towers, which are designed with no moving parts. Inside, the water splashes over a series of baffles, which breaks up the water into small droplets. These droplets mix with air from the open bottom of the tower, evaporating some of the water and cooling the rest by as much as 27 degrees. The newly chilled water returns to the condenser to repeat the process of cooling more steam. Since 1971, First Energy has spent more than five billion dollars on environmental protection. Our plants are equipped with air quality control systems to remove sulfur dioxide and particulates called fly ash. Fly ash is removed by a mechanical process and sulfur dioxide is removed with a chemical reaction using lime. These processes take place in large ductwork scrubber trains located between a unit's boiler and its chimney. Boiler gases pass through scrubbing vessels and are sprayed with slurry, a mixture of water and lime. The sulfur dioxide particles and other pollutants are absorbed by the slurry and fall to the bottom of the vessels. A fan releases the cleansed gases through the chimney. By the time this happens, more than 99% of particulates have been removed, as well as 92% of sulfur dioxide. A plant similar to this one can remove over 400,000 tons of sulfur dioxide each year. The scrubbing process creates huge amounts of a byproduct called calcium sulfite. This plant could create more than 3 million gallons of calcium sulfite slurry each day. First Energy created a process that turns that waste product into a valuable building material called gypsum, which is used to make wallboard or drywall. The slurry leaving the scrubbers is thickened and pumped through a forced oxidation gypsum or fog system. Oxygen is then added, changing it into gypsum, which is dried, treated, and sent to a gypsum manufacturer to make wallboard. First Energy recycles about a half million tons of gypsum each year, enough to manufacture wallboard for 70,000 new homes. Precipitators are another method of extracting coal ash, also called fly ash, which can be recycled or deposited in landfills. This mechanical process extracts fly ash left over from the combustion process. These poles, called wrappers, shake fly ash from a vibrating wire. Gas from the furnace containing fly ash flows into the box. The fly ash drops into a storage chamber and is blown into silos to be loaded into a truck. Fly ash from First Energy plants is used in manufacturing a variety of products, including concrete, grouting, roofing shingles, granules, and anti-skid road materials. First Energy also uses Selective Catalytic Reduction Technology, or SCR, to reduce nitrogen oxide emissions. SCR systems work much like a catalytic converter on a car. Flue gas containing nitrogen oxide emissions from the combustion process is mixed with ammonia. The mixed gases travel through a series of catalytic layers, which causes the nitrogen oxides to react with the ammonia. The reaction converts the nitrogen oxides to water vapor and pure nitrogen, a benign chemical that makes up 80% of the air we breathe. Both elements are returned to the environment through the station stacks.
Now that we've taken a look at how electricity is produced and some of the environmental control protection systems used at our plants, let's take a look at how the electricity is delivered to our homes and businesses. Transformers located just outside the plant boost the power from 18,000 volts to 345,000 volts so it can travel long distances over transmission lines to where it is needed. Substations located along the path reduce the voltage so it can be moved along distribution lines attached to the utility poles. As the electricity nears customer locations, transformers on poles step down the power for use in homes and businesses. Well, hopefully that really kind of explained more um, in detail uh, by seeing the uh, from beginning to end the process. Okay.